Great, thanks everybody for uh, joining today's event. Uh, this book launch is sponsored by the Global Development Studies section of, I of ISA. Um, I'm Isaac Kamola, currently the section chair. If you aren't a member of GDS, I would encourage everyone to join. Um, GDS draws together scholars broadly concerned with development and global justice, working across a number of fields, including um, post-colonial studies, development studies, critical political economy and, uh, and, and other exciting and interesting areas from the discipline. Um, before we begin, I'd also like to, get to, to give a hearty thanks to Christy Belton for helping to organize the event, Alex Hardin for assisting with the technology, and in general for Alex Walker and Courtney Fitzgerald for their work behind the scenes to support um, the section. Uh, today we will be celebrating and critically engaging the recently published book, um, in, um, in international Relations from the Global South, Worlds of Difference, um, edited by Arlene Tickner and Karen Smith. Um, it has chapters from many of my favorite people in the discipline and many of whom are on the call today. Um, if you haven't had a chance to look at it, please do. And as you will hear, um, it does a fantastic job laying the foundations for how we can teach, think, and do international relations differently. So in today's event, um, um, Arlene and Karen will provide a brief introduction of the tech of the project. Um, we have a number of chapter contributors with us today. I'll put the, the names of everyone one, one who is here um, in the, the uh, chat box and they can introduce themselves. Um, Arlene posted a number of questions um, for each chapter author to um, address in their discussion and I placed those in the chat box at, um, as well. We are also lucky to have two fantastic discussion discussants, Gulsha Kappen and Anaita Aryan, who have agreed to provide critical reflections on the work um, and raise a number of important questions, after which we'll open up um, the event for um, um, uh, a discussion. If you have any questions, you can place them in the text in real time and we'll try to keep um, an, uh, an eye on those. Um, I am happy to introduce um, um, the editors of this book. They deserve a much uh, more substantive and um, um, introductions, but on the one hand, they're scholars who need no introduction, and also they deserve much more than I'm getting, I'm giving them here, but alas, I'm out of my allotted time. So um, I'm happy to introduce Karen Smith at the univer uh, University Lecture at Leiden University in The Hague, and Arlene Tickner, um, Professor of International Relations in the School of International Political and Urban Studies at the Universidad del Rosero in Bogota. Um, it, I hand it over to you, Ar Arlene and Karen. Thanks, Isaac. Um, our apologies for the 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 the, the, the late start time and, and and somewhat confusing beginning. Um, Isaac had to introduce um, the the textbook in the event twice. I'm, I apologize for that too, Isaac. Um, I'm really happy um, on behalf of myself and Karen who asked me to speak um, first, but I think she'll, if she doesn't add to what I have to say, she'll, she'll intervene later um, to be discussing our textbook um, with all of you. I want to first thank the ISA and, and the Global Development Section for hosting us, in, in particular Isaac, um, for, for welcoming us um, into this space. Um, however virtual, um, to talk about the textbook. Um, and I'm particularly glad to be able to do this within the framework of ISA, um, given that um, this project was born of many conversations with colleagues, many of whom are here with us today, during the breaks, meals, et cetera, at the annual conventions of, of the association. And also during its very long gestation, which was essentially a six plus years, the project um, traveled additionally to Ephraim, Morocco, New York, Sicily, and was presented and discussed um, before many and I, our colleague, um, in all of these spaces. Um, the, the textbook is essentially a result of a shared discontent with the materials available to professors and students to teach world politics in ways um, more sensitive to the experiences and concerns of Global South countries, professors, and people in general. Although most of its contributors identify with critical dissident strands of, of IR thinking, um, and this inevitably comes across in some of the chapters. Um, for the most part, we try um, intentionally to avoid in-depth discussions or critiques um, or defenses of specific conceptual lenses. Um, we also avoid the increasingly critiqued assumption 
that IR as a discipline of study at least um, is, is somehow different depending upon one's social, cultural, geographical location. Although we do embrace the idea that there are indeed um, myriad approaches to the global or to the international that remain outside of con conventional IR lenses and discussions that beg to be explored um, if greater pluralism is indeed to be achieved in the teaching and study of world politics. Um, developing analyses of the field of IR um, um, of its main conceptual categories like the state, order, security, war and conflict, foreign policy, the international, secularism and religion, um, as we do in the textbook, and some of the key issues of global affairs, such as globalization, migration, poverty, inequality, and whatnot, um, from positionalities and loci that don't take the US-centric US or, US or Eurocentric IR as their point of departure is, is more easily said than done. And I wanna talk about this for a moment. There's been a lot written most recently about how critical scholars ourselves um, take inevitably this point of departure in our critiques. And in this textbook, what we try to do is, is, is take a different point of departure. Um, and, and I think that explains why the book took so long to write because it was hard to do this. Um, and in pedagogy, in addition to research and, and publishing, I think that the logics inscribed within the field create the sensation that we have to teach the canon or the ABC and reference key authors and texts. And within the global south, we find that this sensation is potentially even stronger, as many of us, I think, fear that in not doing so, we somehow disadvantage our own students. So the question that we try to address in the textbook is how we go about decentering our thinking and teaching so that the United States or Eurocentrism isn't the point of departure. Basically what the chapters try to do is begin with stories and narratives that illustrate the misfit between actual experiences in the South and in the North of the global and conventional knowledges within IR. And I think some of our contributors that are here today will attest to the fact that doing this was probably the hardest part of writing these chapters. Coming up with a story or a narrative that actually puts this into relief um, is, is hard. I have no idea why, maybe we can talk about that later, but it was something that many of us found very difficult um, to envision. After doing this, only then does each of the authors briefly examine dominant approaches um, to her or his subject matter, following which the remainder of each chapter is, is dedicated to looking for alternative ways to think about X, Y, or Z subject. Although some of these alternatives are derived indeed from um, IR thinking located within the global south, others aren't. Um, and unsurprisingly, feminism, post-colonialism, a decolonial lens, um, less so um, to my um, dismay, probably radical black theory, um, do indeed appear in some of the chapters. Um, our hope is essentially that a project such as this one that are, reflects consciously and critically upon the Eurocentric, US-centric, Northern racist, gender-laden nature of IR knowledges, and that seeks to displace our attention towards the global South, from which and where most of our contributors are situated, but not all of them, may be of use both in Northern and in Southern classrooms to teach both an IR sensitive to global South experiences but also to those of similarly Southern or peripheral communities situated within the North. And I'm gonna end here just by saying that although the textbook is indeed titled Glo International Relations from the Global South, um, what we find in many of the chapters um, is the relevance of thinking originated in the Global South and, es and elsewhere for thinking about issues um, experienced in the North as well. Um, and I think this um, you know, demystifies one of these um, um, you know, irritating ideas that Global South scholars and problematics can only speak to um, the Global South. Uh, many of the chapters indeed attest to the fact that the ideas that come across when thinking about these key categories and topics in the field are indeed of great relevance for thinking about Northern experiences of the global as well. And I'll stop there, thanks. I'll maybe just add two points, Arlene. I think you've said everything that's important. Maybe, maybe just um, 
one thing that this week I started teaching again in a course, uh, a first year introductory course to international relations, and it kind of just underlined to me again the importance of having a textbook like this, um, because the students were reading a chapter from another prescribed textbook that will remain unnamed. Um, and I was just struck by what, what a different story that that chapter tells about the origins of IR and the development of the field where the global south uh, issues of race and colonialism are essentially absent. They're completely silenced. And it just reminded me how important it is to make sure that students hear these different stories and to be able to see you know, IR in a much more inclusive way that includes stories from different parts of the world and not just from one place. Um, and so maybe I should just say that you know, we've seen since we started talking about this book um, there's been tremendous progress, I think, in the field of IR with regards to research, right? So uh, with regards to making IR more inclusive, um, and I think, and I speak for myself there as well, um, research seems to be easier to do than teaching when it comes to this, this topic for exactly the, the reasons that Arlene has outlined. Um, and so I, I really just want to call on everyone who's listening, um, you know, despite all the efforts made by the ISA, by journals, to include researchers from other parts of the world and to include topics that are perhaps that go beyond the traditional Western centric topics. I think there's lots that remains to be done in terms of, you know, reaching out to students and engaging them on these alternative stories and ways of looking at IR. So I really look forward to hearing what all the authors have to say. As I said uh, before, we all went online. Um, I think this is the first time that I'm actually meeting many of you uh, virtually, unfortunately, but um, I think it's a great opportunity for, for all of us, so not just the audience, to hear what everyone has to say. Uh, and thanks again for, for Isaac and others for organizing it. Should I just start? Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Arlene and Karen, for the introduction, and Isaac, and for the invitation to be here. It's so nice to see a room full of women, actually, by the way. <laughs> Almost. It's very <laughs> an additional bonus to having this uh, awesome lineup. I'm Vivke Wimheuer Vogler. I am a researcher at Freie Universität Berlin. So I'm one of the few authors in this entire textbook who's not located uh, in the Global South or comes from the Global South. But I was anyway um, invited together with my students and my co-author Ingo Peters to write this chapter because we did kind of an experiment <laughs> in um, I think the first time in 2000, 2011 and again in 2013 to actually just teach a class on non-Western uh, IR um, at a German university. And it was very much born out of curiosity and learning from the teachers as well. So it was very, I would say it was, it was very not top down. <laughs> it was a bottom up project of the students really wanting this. And it was a very unique experience in student teacher engagement. And we learned a lot from, from the way they wanted to unlearn things. And this is what our chapter is about and what Karen also already pointed at, if you want to change anything in a discipline, we really think you have to start in the classroom. And doing this with this amazing textbook, of course, is, the, is a great way to do this. But even beyond that, it's um, about using this resource of curiosity the students have. And they are way more open to learn about epistemic violence and about different alternative approaches to the discipline. But the first thing I think is important is to make them aware that there is something like a sociology of the discipline and a history of the discipline. And that knowledge is not just something you read in a textbook. And I think we can, Karen, we can name many of them or not name many of them that are out there on the market. Um, and think about that they were written by someone and for someone and that all the things and all the concepts that are in those chapters uh, in those chapters come from somewhere and i think the first step then is to make students aware of this and the second step is for teachers to listen <laughs> what they have to say and what they want to to change in a discipline 
And the third step is to have this to a broader audience. So what we actually did, we have an edited volume uh, made out of our student papers and made them legitimate participants in, the, um, in, in this discussion on, on global IR. And since we started this in 2010, 2011, a lot of things have changed, right? I mean, you all of all were in this room know that the whole debate got much bigger and the audience got bigger and you were heard in, in different um, arenas that was impossible in 2010. And Arlene worked hard to do this and a lot of other people in this room created this stage. But when we started, it was really hard on the students. We were like, okay, so have a talk on non-Western security studies. And we kind of left them alone there. <laughs> so for them to do the research and it was very hard for them to find anything. Um, and then to discuss it in in um, in ways that makes it really good. And one last thing, and I, I know my time is up, but one concept I want to bring in just quickly is the freedom of choice for students in choosing their topics. Because in, in Berlin, I really often have to, you know, if you have a Chinese student, you expect them to speak about China, and that goes all across the board, whereas the German students can do whatever they want. And I think this is not unique to, to, to Germany or university, but this freedom of choice that you can write about whatever you want, no matter where you come from or what you, you, know, you bring to the table, I think that's very important too. I thank you for your time and I'm really looking forward to the other <laughs> talks. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Ruki. I think I can pick up the pieces from here. Um, thank you, Isaac, um, Arlene, and Karen uh, for bringing this uh, part together. Um, I'm just going to uh, pick on a couple of points that um, Arlene and Vipke have um, already made and so did Karen uh, uh, responding to some questions that um, Arlene had raised. We started this venture by uh, trying to address the discontent that many of us shared. Uh, that as uh, you know, teachers in Global South, when we want to teach IR, uh, we lack materials. But uh, I uh, want to say that by the time the project was finished, I personally feel, and I think I'm good to know that it's uh, my sentiment is shared uh, with the colleagues, that the book is not only meant for students in the Global South, it's meant for as much in students in the global north, what Karen and Vipke both pointed out, because uh, uh, you know, if the voices from the south have been completely silenced, the textbooks that uh, the global north students have been uh, fed on, uh, you know, have such uh, sort of one-sided picture of the international realities, and uh, uh, where whatever they speak about the global south is sometimes I find so divorced from the ground realities uh, that we experience in our lives uh, in this part of the world. Uh, so I think it's, it's, it's basically trying to bring in those voices, which to my mind remains on the margins, be they in global south or they be in global north. Uh, and sometimes, I mean, in my chapter on state and sovereignty, several examples that I brought up were actually belonging to Native Americans within the United States of America. So the heart of Anglo-American IR also has silences within, which we were trying to uh, uh, sort of bring out. And the second important point, I agree again with uh, uh, both uh, uh, my earlier uh, speakers is, uh, after 10 years of doing researching in terms of trying to pluralize or decenter the discipline of IR, I think pedagogy is perhaps the single most important platform to start uh, uh, changing and sort of reimagining the international because What's happening is uh, advertently, inadvertently, when we use the standard methods or texts of teaching IR, you know, what Arlene said that we feel compelled to teach the canon uh, to our students. Uh, unfortunately, I find that we are, re we are reinforcing uh, sort of the old traditional IR in the generations to come. And I think we're doing a real great disservice there. Uh, if we want them, many of them, to join the ranks of, uh, you know, academia and practice uh, in the years to come. Uh, it's important to change things in the classroom first and foremost. And considering uh, there's so many teachers among us, and I find each teacher uh, touches the lives of so many students. Uh, if there is one place to begin bringing, making a change, uh, I think pedagogy and the classroom teaching is one of the really key important places to make that change. 
Uh, the third point I wanted to make was the point Arlene mentioned too. Uh, I am one of those who found very difficult to find these stories, which were going to be short and succinct and yet convey the disquiet and the discomfort uh, uh, that we experience. But I must admit that once I started, I, I started looking differently and talking to people differently, I realized that they were galore. There were so many stories that I could narrate. In fact, I remember Arlene chasing me for six months, Namita, your chapter is ready. Where are the stories? And I'm like, I can't find the story. You know, and eventually I came up with four stories and she said, now you have one too many. You know, you need to reduce them because it's difficult to find. But important thing was the moment you change your lens and you don't look for traditional IR, uh, then you really find, uh, you know, there is so much out there. And I learned a lot from my own classroom teaching, I must admit, because I find the abstract concepts uh, don't touch students. Uh, you know, if you bring the stories in, you can relate to their lives. You can, you can make the subject uh, come closer to them uh, to the extent you can make them relate to their daily lives. How does it make a difference in their daily lives? To that extent, I found stories to be a very powerful way of uh, breaking the ice and uh, sort of taking away this fear of IR theory. Uh, you know, the introductory courses. So I found that a very, very useful device. And uh, thanks Arlene, Karen, and the previous editors for sticking the, you know, to their guns that we must not let go of this very, very important stand. The one thing that I just want to talk, last point is about my own chapter, uh, uh, is the e-problematic that I talked about, which I thought resonates across the textbook. And uh, by E problematic, I refer to about three parts, the Eurocentricism, the epistemological frames and the empiricism. I found all three of them uh, very limiting uh, in terms of the way we understand and we do IR and very inadequate uh, uh, in terms of uh, actually telling us about the world, uh, about the multiple worlds uh, that we are actually trying to understand. This whole business of these multiple worlds somehow turning into one universe and that one universe you know sought to be explained in these simple uh, parsimonious epistemological frames uh, is actually a very poor way of going about doing justice to the richness and to the diversity of experiences all around so uh, i enjoyed writing this as much uh, as being part of this collaborative effort and learning a lot uh, from my fellow colleagues. I really hope uh, people and students and fellow scholars enjoy it just as much, but thank you. I think I'm out of my time. Apana, your microphone is muted. Okay, I can... Um, I'm on, right? Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, great. Okay, so I want to thank the organizers, and I especially want to thank Arlene, who um, patiently stuck through this project. She could have easily uh, given up, um, you know, early on, but she persevered, and um, glad Karen also then joined, and, and I think it's been a great project, and I'm really um, happy to be a part of it. And what's also great about what I what I really liked about this project is that it's a truly global one. I think there are authors that are scattered everywhere all around the world, even in the global south, which is not often the case with these projects. So I think the authors have made a, a real effort to do that, to include people who are also located in the global south. And I think the book definitely fills a necessary gap because we just don't have enough of these uh, textbooks that are written from a global, you know, non-Eurocentric perspective. So I think it's it's an important book uh, in that sense. Um, what is challenging, and I think I think the book also had to grapple with these um, kind of paradoxes or, or, or problems is when you're teaching or writing from, the, from a global South perspective, you, you tend to teach against the dominant perspectives. So the dominant, so dominant IR still continues to set the terms of what we must talk about that counts as IR. And then we, you know, we write or teach against the grain to provide alternative conceptualizations. And 
this is how dominant IR, in a sense, continues to um, to remain, you know, um, central. And I think this is something that Arlene raised that there are some practical difficulties in trying to overcome this, especially for those who teach in the global south, because you don't want to create a disadvantage for your students. She mentioned that already. And I think there are some real practical implications when you try to, to decenter because, for instance, in the case of India, students are still writing entrance exams for their master's and PhD programs, um, which in which IR, the, the, uh, the focus of IR is completely um, uh, the mainstream perspective, particularly realism. It's still Waltz and Morgenthau. And um, the other perspectives are not really you know, you don't really, you're not required to show familiarity. And sometimes it's actually a disadvantage to be, to, to put forth these perspectives um, in, in, in cases of interviews, for instance, and I've seen that happen. You know, interviews, um, interviews that are, um, you're required to do interviews in order to get into these programs. And um, I've witnessed that where students have been penalized for actually bringing in these uh, critical perspectives in these settings. So, um, you know, so the so this is the challenge. How do you uh, teach IR um, when you, you're trying to decenter it, and yet there are practical difficulties? And this is even more so as Arlene, as Arlene mentioned in the global south. There tends to be a, a a greater passion and vigor to to discipline IR or to police it, almost like the passion of a convert. You know, so um, it's a, it's this is a this is a challenge. Some of this is getting. Um, uh, some of this is changing with increasing privatization of universities where there's greater autonomy over syllabi and course content and what teachers can teach. But that brings in new kinds of hierarchies as to who gets exposed to decolonial IR and who gets to talk about it. So that's bringing in a whole different array of challenges. So um, I also hope textbooks like this are widely available to students in the global south. And that's something that I know Arlene and I talked about um, is access because a lot of these materials are published in the North. And as Navnida said, yes, it's very important that the students here read it, but um, students in the global North read it as well as, but it's also important that students in the global South get access to these kinds of uh, materials. So that's something that I think um, is, you know, also needs to be addressed. And it's, it, that's also a challenge um, oftentimes. So I'll end here, thanks. Okay. Um, thank you, everyone. You put me totally off from my speaking points, so I have to take all these new notes, so I have to go through them. Uh, but one thing, just observations quickly. Uh, one thing, I'm struck by how we're, everyone is so hum I mean, Thank you. I'm, I've, you know, cut off the thank yous. That doesn't mean uh, I'm not thanking with full heart to Arlen, who's I've seen very close hand struggle through to finalize this project, which I mean, and Karen, who, you know, came to the rescue, like being a first hand uh, witness, I, I cannot explain enough how much effort and perseverance and love and care these projects take place. So it's a lot of work. So um, I was going to cut off, but I couldn't say. So having said that, um, uh, just observations. I'm literally, I'm not pretending. I literally am thrown off my uh, list of things that I was going to go through, but I was so uh, struck by all uh, the things that were said so far. And one uh, brief observation. I think we need to make note that so far, everyone was not just talking about the accomplishments of the book, but was starting with the challenges of, of this whole endeavor, which I think is quite striking. So it tells me at least to us that uh, we are not talking about achievements, but we're talking about a road that is being, you know, uh, you know just, just being starting to travel. So, uh, so I, I, I take that as a very important point. Um, and um, so whatever, I mean, it's a great book, uh, but it's something, it's a wonderful starting point, I think. That's my observation. Uh, the second uh, point, uh, again, I'm thrown off, uh, was, um, uh, was for me personally, uh, was the challenge to re-envisioning when I was asked, I was, I was a quite a latecomer to the project. And, and when I was asked to contribute, 
um, uh, I, I was, okay, I need to rethink this and I need to rethink it because I myself had my personal experience teaching in Istanbul after many years at the University of Minnesota, having been you know, exposed to a totally different experience. Uh, I'm coming back and I was trying to teach a course on uh, Turkish foreign policy. And I stopped teaching that course literally three years ago. I can't teach it anymore because I don't, I, I, I can't find the resources. Most of the time it's very state centric. It's very like, even if it's not, uh, you know, located on the global north, it's uh, again, it's very reactionary and very state centric, et cetera. So I personally was like, I can't teach this course. And when I was asked to write this chapter, it's like, okay, how am I going to do this? Um, I found it quite challenging, to be honest, um, to seriously th sit down and think about uh, in non-state centric terms, some a very state centric practice. Uh, uh, which is foreign policy, That's, that was my chapter. And um, thankfully, Karen and Arlen had described what I was trying to do better than I could perhaps in my chapter by suggesting that I was trying to write the Global South uh, foreign policy as um, not necessarily talking about a certain geopolitical space, but also as a certain political positionality and ethical subjectivity. But uh, with that, but I want to, uh, I personally, uh, although uh, as a scholar, as a researcher, uh, as a teacher, I try to challenge myself to undo my ways of thinking, I, I find it quite challenging. And I, it was a, thankfully uh, for, to Arlen uh, and Karen and all the other contributors that I kind of found my way, but I don't think it is easy. Uh, the second challenge, I'm not looking at the minutes, somebody stop me if I'm speaking too much, but uh, second challenge, uh, uh, I was li listening to Wiebke and listening to what Namita said uh, and uh, what Aparna said. Um, th this is a point that uh, from there, uh, what they've said, I was thinking. Um, so wishing to unlearn or wishing to unthink might be our wishes but sometimes the audience can also be quite resistant, right? Uh, like in my case, my students, unfortunately, unlike the students perhaps in Germany that we've can met, my students was quite content with the state-centric foreign policy discourses that was, uh, you know, uh, pervaded by the states and other politicians and they were fed through the media. So uh, me as a scholar and as a woman scholar coming from the US, I find it quite challenging to try to help them unlearn. So that was one part of the challenge that I personally, from a pedagogical side, which I took from Namita, uh, ped pedagogy is very important, but sometimes you are faced with a resistant crowd. How are you going to take you along with a new, uh, with, with them with, on a new, new path is quite challenging. And finally, last point, I will stop here. I also want to, uh, with this, I wanted to uh, take this tiny moment to salute all the resistance around by the faculty and by the students, by everyone who are involved in this, in and out of the classroom. To, uh, who are trying to make it possible for us to have these conversations, because these are not just conversations that are enabled by our institutional frameworks, but also by all the struggles that are going on in and outside of the academy. So I, I just want to note that, and on that note, I will shut up. I'm so happy and thrilled to be a part of this conversation. Thank you. So they go now. So I also would like to thank Carlene, Karin, and also the Global Development Section. I'm so glad to be here finally. <laughs> and this I was, we were in this project since I think 2013. And uh, so it, I'm so glad that Arlene and Karin just kept moving it and now we are here all together. I'd like also to greet everybody that is, has shared this task with us. So I, I, we are, I'm, going to, I'm going to address the question about how do we teach? And uh, we, I said, so how do we teach social environmentalism? 
So in our chapter, we discussed social, social environmentalism as a concept and as a practice that emerged in the Brazilian Amazon, but it has similarities in others, with other experiences around the world. And basically, social environmentalism uh, is the intrinsic correlation between the social and the nat natural worlds, or that there's no separation between nature and society, and that justice, ecological sustainability, participation, and recognition of other ways of knowing are part of the same struggle. Uh, also in the Brazilian Amazon, social environmentalism reminds us that the drivers of environmental depletion are the same as the drivers of land dispossession, violence, death, and now the spread of COVID-19 among indigenous peoples and the local communities in, in Brazil, like all quilombolas, indigenous peoples, local peoples. And uh, so uh, all the drivers are the same. So who speaks for the local people and who speaks for nature? That's more or less what social, environment, social environmentalism is all about. And how do we teach it? I, one way that I have been finding that's useful to teach this is taking my students to do experiential learning, really taking the students to the Amazon and also to the Cerrado that's very close to Brasilia. And so they can see and experience the forest, the savannas or the Cerrado here in Brazil, but also talk to the local people and to exchange the ideas. So more or less is how we approach this or I approach this in Brazil, in Brasilia. And in my view, there's no other way to teach global environmental politics in Brazil than emphasizing this notion of social environmentalism then that all these struggles like the, for the earth and for people, they all go, they are together. So that's my, more or less my take, thank you. Hello, I would like also to, to thank uh, Arlene and Karen for the opportunity and to thank Christina also for uh, inviting me to, to be part of this chapter, so, Social Environmentalism, when I was a not so, so young uh, PhD student in, in, in University of Brasilia. So uh, building on what, on what Christina said, I would like to, to focus my presentation more on an invitation uh, to construct or to build a greener or more environmental international relations. Now in this effort to incorporate different visions of the international, different visions of the world and bring it to the, to the, class, to the classroom. So I feel that this development has been growing in IR community, but I feel that we can do more regarding that. So, but I also feel that this invitation involves a previous step or another invitation maybe, and it's to consider environmental issues as a central part of our approximation to international relations, right? It's a central pillar for understanding or to addressing the world and, and, and even humanity. And not, not, and not some maybe politically correct uh, acknowledgement in a footnote that something happens, right? Okay, we talk about other things, but at the end we, we feel the need to talk about, about the environment because it is politically correct, but we don't, assess it as a fundamental part of our existence and our understanding of, of, of words and our world, different worlds. So, and, and, and I guess this is the central message or one of the central messages of our concept, of, of this concept of social environmentalism that we talk in our, in our chapter. I will like address a little what, what I know from, from Latin America, uh, maybe talking from, from, from this place and being a mega diverse continent, highly vulnerable to, to, to climate change, uh, with many vulnerable populations living in danger, as Christina talked about, and obvious economic, social, and political challenges. However, I feel that our contribution to, to environmental studies, uh, though it's growing in, in Latin America, is still limited. In part, this is in part, this is due to the concentration of resources, networks, and established epistemic communities in the North, but also feel that we, we can do more. From, from Latin America, I, I don't feel comfortable talking about the Global South in general, but what I 
from the place I, I might know a little more. And we are not maybe generating enough theoretical and empirical studies. So this would be for me like kind of a, a third a kind of invitation to engage in this debate regarding environmental issues in IR and bring this debate to the, to the classrooms. And, and just, uh, uh, just to, to finish um, and picking up also something that, that Christina said about the pandemics, I, I, we, also, we also feel we have talked about this that uh, the pandemics might, might be a window of, of opportunity to assimilate these this environmental issues as a central understanding of our world. And particularly, particularly because of, of the relation between, between this pandemic and probably future pandemics has to do with ecosystem stress and aggression to our system. So I hope this, uh, this uh, like warning sign make us more uh, conscious about this, this issue. So thank you very much again for this opportunity. I also thank um, Karen and Erlene and Isaac for this opportunity. I, I think I'm the last one because our chapter is the last one. And uh, it's, it's, hard, it's hard to present this chapter without remembering uh, Professor Lane. Um, Professor Ling was uh, an important part of the project and invited me to co-author with her this chapter back in 2013. And I, in hearing everybody, uh, it's, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very, it's a privilege to you to be able to, to understand a little bit better um, why our partnership in this chapter uh, started how it started. And um, the anecdote behind the chapter is because I, as a student of Professor Ling, uh, used, started challenging her, why is your audience always the North? Um, I come from Brazil. I've been in New York for a long time, for more than 12 years now. But I, my background is in law. I studied at the University of Brasilia and I had the pleasure to meet Cristina last time I went to, to my hometown. And, and I, was, I was asking, really, there's so, there's so much. There's so, what are we calling plural, pluralism and other views that are yet to know each other. And why are we always um, speaking, as one of the panelists said, um, against the dominant perspectives? We have so much to learn from each other. And in this exercise, we might actually learn something that will also contribute to the dialogue and the communication between South and North. And that's how we engaged in, in, this, in this partnership. I had, I, some years before meeting um, Professor Ling, I had engaged in a, in a firsthand experience traveling around South America for three months and visiting um, a lot of archeological sites myself in order to discover many different views. And I worked with native Brazilians um, as a lawyer back in 2006, uh, a long time ago. And so I had some um, hands-on experience with communities and theorizing for me, it was very natural from that perspective as I didn't have so much of the, um, of the challenges that a lot of you Faced. So it was a good partnership in that regard because we we're able to freely uh, build uh, what was at the end called in this textbook the futures. And uh, and we are alone. We are we have one only one um, article in this part. And for us, we started thinking about what are the views, the world views that are out there that could speak to each other and based on that, create a platform that we could actually engage on an epistemological level, but ultimately speaking on an ontological level. Uh, so we are all allowed to be what we are, but not afraid of challenging and, and going against and clashing or integrating and losing, but creating something new. So that's how we came up uh, with the um, what do we call the creative listening um, method? Um, under, no, that, that's uh, 
that came from Lili's wordest um, epistemological framework in which we tried to build a third space and an oasis of communication where different kinds of old ways of thinking or even unknown ways of thinking could, could combine efforts and based on Taoist philosophy and Taoist principles of ontological party, we are all the same, even though there is structural asymmetry, even though there are, um, you know, power uh, unfairness. If we consider from a, disc a discursive, uh, uh, from, from the point of view of how we can speak to each other and listen to each other in the same, the same level, we could actually create an assumption that are multiple worldviews and that we could relate to each other. And we found that, we found that resonance between worldist, um, her, her, her reference of worldism and the Indianism philosophy of the living of the philosophy of living well or El Buen Vivir uh, that was spread out in Bolivia and Ecuador as a political framework as well for their own constitutions. And we said, well, there is some resonance and we, create, we started combining through this creative listening and speaking method to see what it would do. And further, we went to a conference in um, Portugal, in Coimbra. It was the only time through the six years of this project that Lily and I were able to present this chapter together. And all the other opportunities, life separated us. And that was the only opportunity that we spoke, that we were together. And when Boaventura de Souza Santos, one of the organizers of the events, I had the pleasure to introduce them. And we were like, well, now six years before we were, I was trying to tell you about that. And then it was a love whole movement saying, um, you know, to be introduced to, to, to different worldviews that with a capability of not only creating engagement from the point of view of being defensive or just deconstructing as so many post-colonial scholars do and rightfully and uh, gladly, but to go beyond, to go beyond that challenge to be a little bit more creative and constructive and proposing uh, what we are then uh, going back to the initial, the future of IR. So I, have, I think my time's up, but that's, uh, I, I, I would like to end this as in an optimistic note because so much has happened, but in, in trying to dialogue amongst um, ourselves and different worldviews from the South, we might dismantle hegemony in a very different fashion, not the old fashion of um, taking power, but actually building something completely new that we can create different names as we go along. Thank you. Great, Carolina. Um, so I'm going to take over here. Um, I first want to thank uh, Isaac and uh, the GDS section for organizing this roundtable on, uh, on this wonderful and impressive book. And I want to congratulate uh, Arlene, Karen, uh, the previous editors and all the contributors that are uh, involved uh, with the publication of this wonderful and extremely important and necessary book. Um, I can only applaud the commendable efforts that many of you, especially the editors, and I think especially Arlene over the years, um, have made and the time and dedication that you have uh, devoted to this project. Publishing a book of this magnitude is not an easy task, uh, but you have absolutely succeeded in bringing IR perspectives from the global south and how these perspectives differ from conventional IR in the global north to classrooms across the entire globe. So not only used for, for the global south, but definitely also for the global north. Years ago, I wrestled with the same question of how to teach IR perspectives from the global south um, to undergraduate students in the global north. And back then out of a sheer necessity, uh, I based my course on articles and book chapters that was quite disparate. But uh, what I really missed was a comprehensive volume that systematically dealt with this subject matter. So your book has filled now in a very important gap and its format and setup are ideal for teaching IR from the global south to students across the entire world. Um, not only does it convey the perspectives from the global south, but also the problems with conventional IR and also important how knowledge production itself 
and the universalization of certain narratives in and about IR are embedded in power relations. By focusing on concepts that are endemic in conventional IR and how these are understood and experienced in the global south, the book opens the pathways for systematically rethinking IR in the classroom, and it enables students, but also teachers, to explore and understand the many diverse worlds that exist beyond their own. Notwithstanding the breadth, richness, and scope of the book, I do invite the editors and the contributors to reflect on a number of questions. So as I said, I think the setup is great um, and the focus on concepts. Uh, but I was wondering why, for example, the, uh, the concept of peace did not make it to the book. Um, although Karen Smith does shortly address it in her chapter on uh, uh, address the concept of peace of non-Western philosophers, and Arlene uh, Tickner also discusses the problems with the democratic peace theory, I thought that it would have been interesting if the concept of peace itself would have had a chapter on its own. Similarly, I thought that it would also have been interesting to have a separate chapter on the concept of justice uh, and the concept of power uh, and their various dimensions and how they're understood in the global south. The reason why is that perhaps such explorations would have also uh, allowed us to examine the convergences uh, between the global north and south on understandings of justice, peace, and power. In addition, um, Another concept or issue perhaps that would have been interesting to be included in the book is international law and the International Court of Justice, which is part and parcel of international politics and international relations. And here again, uh, the Global South, I think does play a very important role. So it would have been interesting also to understand how in the Global South international law and the international courts of justice uh, and the international criminal court for that regard are viewed. Um, how do they see these institutions? But most importantly, what kind of contributions have they made to the development of international law itself? How have they deployed it in their resistance against the global north, uh, but also against one another? Uh, because this is also an issue that is on there. So perhaps for pragmatic reasons, perhaps for time, uh, shortage of time, these concepts may not have made it, but I was just wondering, maybe there was an intrinsic reason, maybe it was just a practical reason. Uh, but nonetheless, the volume does uh, open up the space for more work to come. So, the, uh, so this is definitely the case. Um, another uh, issue or um, thing is that, well, on a different note, the book takes issue with the Eurocentrism in the field of IR, mostly targets in this regard, conventional and mainstream IR. But I was wondering where this would leave us with critical theory, uh, with capital letters and with small letters. So uh, could we mark that also as Eurocentric? Um, Navnita, for example, does address this implicitly in her chapter when she discusses the concepts of state and how feminist uh, theory, but also postmodernist theory basically buys into that concept that, that is basically a West-centric concept. But I was more generally wondering, where should we locate critical theory with small and capital letters in IR and in our debates about Eurocentrism and in uh, our debates about approaches and methodologies for understanding international relations and doing research about it. Finally, um, I just wanna address um, two um, narratives that run through the book. Um, I think it, might have been in retrospect productive if there was a, a chapter on colonialism. And the reason why is that there are two narratives that, that at times seem to contradict each other, not necessarily contradict, but there is a certain tension there. Um, and this basically is also visible more in decolonial scholarship and perhaps also in post-colonial scholarship that these narratives emerge and reside often. Um, and I think it's related to differential, differential experiences of colonialism itself. Uh, and it would have been um, perhaps interesting to explore that more in detail in the book. What I refer here is first to the narrative that is mostly embedded in decolonial scholarship of, of Walter Minolo, for example, who argues that um, in the last five centuries, um, uh, due to Western colonialism, there is a significant extent of epistemicide of indigenous cultures and knowledge and other forms of uh, knowledge. Um, and that we're still living in this coloniality of power, so to say. So that knowledge production still is 
structured within this um, condition, so to say. Um, in his work, Manolo treats often the West as a single endogenous subject. So, uh, and his work is often referenced. But on the other side, we have the narrative of historians, um, particularly like Hobson, who has contributed to the book, who actually decenters the central role of the West in the history. And this is a different narrative. Here, the narrative is that um, the West has not been predominant since 1492, and that it will be Euro Eurocentric if we would put it at that place. And that uh, if we look at the West, it became only a center of power in the 19th century. And that the West is not an endogenous entity, that all its successes and achievements have been conditioned by its interactions with other parts of the world. So it completely deconstructs this idea of, uh, of, of a West actually. So there's, it's a very different narrative of, uh, of the West, so to say. Um, and I sense there is there's a tension here. Uh, and then Hobson also pushes even further by saying, well, even in the 19th century, when it became the center of, of the world in, in terms of power, uh, it was still re resisted. So it did not mean that an end came to the resistances against the West. So here there's an insertion of active agency um, in, on the part of non-Western states in this narrative, while in the other narrative of the, 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 the colonial narrative of Walter Milolo, the agency of these non-Western elements in Western practices are basically obscured. And so I was wondering, how do we, um, of course, there are many narratives of Western colonialism, but within our South-South talk, as Carolina uh, indicated at the end of learning each other, um, how do we navigate this tension between differential experiences? So I will leave it at that. And I wanna thank again, uh, Arlene and Karen and all the contributors for a wonderful and impressive book that they have put out there. Thank you. Um, should I go? Okay. Um, I'll be really quick because I think there are a lot of great questions waiting in the Q&A and also I think everything that could be said has been said. Uh, so I'm not sure there's much else for me to add to all the wonderful discussions. Uh, I just want to uh, sort of, uh, first of all, thank you for inviting me uh, and thank you for the book. I just keep imagining myself being this, you know, university student way back uh, in Turkey, where nothing made sense, right? They kept talking about all these theories, and I just kept looking, saying, "This is not how it is in reality. Why do you keep telling me these things?" So, uh, you know, uh, it sort of makes me happy to think that there is something, uh, a book there that we can at least uh, start the discussion with. Right? And I think that's uh, sometimes the hardest part uh, of uh, all of these uh, discussions is where do we start from? So now you have something to uh, you know, uh, base the course on, to start the discussion from, which also came back to me years later when I was teaching in Turkey uh, and the difficulty of trying to organize uh, based on, and this was sort of touched upon, but I think that is a very important point, the structural constraints that come from the university and uh, everything that you want to do and how that gets mediated. Uh, but despite all that, I, what I want to sort of uh, ask and hopefully maybe enter into dialogue with is uh, the possibilities that this book sort of opens for us. Uh, and the further dialogue that we might get to have from this premise. Uh, and the first aspect of it that I want to sort of uh, ask all of you is, uh, how has it sort of changed your teaching? Do you use it in teaching? And how has it sort of changed, uh, you know, uh, added to it, taken from it, the responses to it? Uh, the, the other aspect of it that I'm very curious about is, uh, I mean, and I hate to mention the, the concepts and the organization of the book, which um, I understand in, in the sense of 
of course, we have to sort of enter into dialogue with certain disciplinary concepts and everything, right? But within those hierarchies of knowledge, the thing I was wondering is, after having written this, what would be the next chapter you would like to write uh, in terms of questioning all of these hierarchies? Like, what would be, if there were no constraints, uh, you know, publishers and universities and all those boring things, uh, what would be the, uh, the chapter you would have written? Is it different than the one you ended up writing? And what would, like, I would love to hear about that if possible. Thank you. Arlene, it, it, okay, um, okay, I can try to. Um, thank you all for your, your, your interventions. I, I'm going to try to be brief because we've agreed that each of us will try to react to um, both Anaita and Gulsha's comments and, and some of the fascinating questions that are in the Q&A. So I won't try to, to adjust. All. And there's several questions for specific participants like Asla, in case you want to look in the Q&A, Asla. Um, thank you so much. Um, I'm going to answer several of the questions briefly. Uh, Anaita asks quite rightly why certain topics <laughs> were not included. Um, there's a very simple answer. Um, all of the topics that you mentioned, peace, justice, international law, those in particular, were chapters that we would have loved to have um, and unfortunately could not identify authors to write them. I must have invited over 10 um, colleagues to write the chapter on international law. I will not name them. Um, one in particular just did not come through. Several, um, in, in especially younger scholars, um, reported back that they couldn't um, divert their attention to a textbook because their universities had um, put them under you know, pressure to produce journal articles and, and scholarly books. And so I think this speaks to um, some of the, the, the more negative results of internationalization processes in higher education. That was a response that I received from many people. Um, I wrote the chapter on war and conflict, um, not because it would have been my first choice, which will lead me to respond to Gusha's question, but because we also could not find an author um, for war and conflict. And living in Colombia, um, Karen, I think, remembers um, at the end, I said to her, my God, there's, there's no chapter on peace. Um, we've just gone through a peace process several years ago. We're talking about, you know, peace building in Colombia. How, how is it possible that, you know, there's not a chapter on peace? So the peace, the peace factor was something that was, I think, more of an afterthought, unfortunately. These are all things that I think we're, we're, we're acutely aware of um, and that hopefully if we were to be given the opportunity to do a second um, edition, um, we would have the chance to, to repair um, some of the, the, the absences that I think are, 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 are in the chat. I mean, there's a lot more. I don't want to detail them too much to, to, to disencourage you from, from reading it. But, you know, these efforts, I think, are increasingly difficult in the, in the academic world in which we live. Um, and it's a, it's a huge paradox because we talk all the time about the need to, to develop you know, more, more effective pedagogical tools. But at the same time, most of our universities um, do not um, provide incentives and, and quite the contrary in many cases for actually producing um, these type of alternative approaches. So that's how I would respond. I, I, I take to your other suggestions quite, um, quite, you know, quite seriously. I think they're all tremendously important um, observations. I'm not sure about the tension between um, you know, the, 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 the centrality of colonialism and the attempt to visualize um, agency of the global south. We'll talk about that after maybe someone else wants to, to reflect on that. I, I think, I'm not sure it's a tension in, in the textbook, it's a tension within scholarship. Um, uh, it, and I think that the textbook actually, to, to, in its defense, um, tries to make visible both tendencies, um, that is colonialism and racism and issues of gender um, are, are transversal to many of the chapters. But at the same time, um, the stories themselves that many of the chapters tell and begin with and, and, the, and the attempt to visualize um, global South originated thinking um, actually puts into play um, important ways of looking at the agency of the global South. So yeah, we could think more explicitly about the tension, which we do not, you're right, 
but I'm, but I think that both um, aspects are, are there. Um, I just wanted to mention what chapter I would have written if, 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 if I had been given the opportunity. Um, my original chapter was on film. Um, I wanted to do um, something on, on the role of popular culture and the representation of realities in the global south. Um, which is actually a course that I taught um, for many years, which I've sadly not been teaching recently. Um, I thought, you know, um, one of the, the, the reviewers of the textbook when we presented it suggested that we introduce more, you know, popular culture types of things. Um, and I was unable to do it because I had to write the chapter on, on war and conflict. Um, something that Carolina brought up, and I think I'm going to stop here, is, is that her and Lily's chapter, and I just want to say, um, Lily, Lily um, sadly departed this world um, before the textbook came out um, and, and she withdrew as an editor from the textbook at a certain point, um, I think out of largely frustration that I shared as well, um, that, that it was so hard to produce this. Um, I, I think in retrospect, when I imagine her reaction, she, you know, she, she often said how difficult it was to do a project like this and, and that's why it was taking so long. I think. I think she would have been really happy to see that we actually persisted and were able to, to take this to the, to, you know, to the publication stage. But going back to what Carolina mentioned, her and Lily's chapter on alternatives or futures is the only chapter on, in the textbook that actually um, goes about proposing tr real alternatives. Um, and, and I just want to pick that up. That's what I think is, is also missing. Um, and, and that's what I would like to think about. The most important part of that chapter, and, and this goes back to something that someone else mentioned, and I will stop here, is the need to envision um, alternatives in which um, the North or the West or the core is not um, the central node through which um, the conversations take place. And so what this chapter does is to create direct chatting, they call it, um, between um, different ways of, of experiencing and thinking about the world. Um, and I think if we could only envision um, more of these alternatives um, that engage directly um, between different ways of, of, of talking about the world, experiencing the world of, of actually marginal Southern, whatever you want to call them, actors. That's what I would um, think that I would at least want to continue tri contributing to as, as a means of, of making um, the textbook more robust in that sense of thinking about alternatives. I'll stop. I could have said so many other things, but there's not much time. So maybe someone else can pick up on the questions that I did not answer. I'll jump in quickly, but yeah, I think uh, I think a lot of the the chapter authors have lots to say about many of these questions as well. But maybe just kind of picking up Arlene where you ended off in terms of you know what does the future look like, um, and you know what might another book look like that that builds on this one? Because absolutely, I think the point that was made that you know this is this is a starting point, right? This is not this is not the end. There need to be many many textbooks that that deal with these issues. And that grapple with some of the problems that both Anahita and Gulsha, I think, you know, very, very kind of clearly identified that we struggled with in, in, in the many years that we were working with this textbook as well. Um, and I think, as Arlene has pointed out, that there's so much potential there to build on, particularly the last chapter. So to say, okay, if we look back at the chapters that were written by people from different parts of the world on different topics, there are so many kind of commonalities between them, right? So, 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 you know, how do we draw those out? And I think Asli was also talking about how um, it was really interesting to see that there were these, these similarities between particularly different parts of the global South. And, you know, just personally, I think that for me has been the most encouraging thing working in this, this field as well, to realize that, well, this is very interesting. You know, you read about Latin American perspectives and African perspectives and Asian perspectives. And, and they have a lot to say to one another. So I think that absolutely is where we should be going from now and if, from here. And I think we do need to use Carolina's wording as well, a lot of creativity here. Um, and I think this, again, I, I kind of hear Lily in the background here. I think she's with us in, in the virtual room. Um, you know, if I had to write another chapter, it would be one along the kind of chapter that, you know, or the books that Lily was writing a kind of fairy tale of IR. So really, you know, just the story, because we really tried to bring stories into this project. But of course, you know, stories were part of it. And we inevitably ended up 
I think, you know, uh, because of all the, the challenges that people have pointed out, you kind of get sucked back into, oh, but I have to write in a way that somehow, you know, people in IR will understand. So I can't just write a story. I have to refer to some of these concepts that are somehow familiar. Um, and that brings me to Anahita's point, um, you know, the question of concepts. That, that was something that we talked about, you know, wh what should the chapters be about? Should they should they be about concepts that you know you would find in other IR textbooks? And of course, we have a bit of a mixed bag. We have some some concepts title, you know, chapter titles that will be familiar to IR scholars and, and others that are not. Um, and that was a difficult decision, but I think it also speaks to this question about what is Western and what is what is non-Western. Um, and can we assume that you know a concept like war? Wh why is that a Western concept? Uh, why, why is order a Western concept? So I think it's also grappling with that and saying, well. Sure, these concepts have been claimed by Western mainstream IR, uh, but that doesn't mean that uh, we haven't seen the global self exercising agency to come to your point about that as well, in terms of shaping these ideas and concepts in a completely different way. Um, yeah, Gulsha, I was just, I mean, you, you, I think you've just opened up a whole new Pandora's box, you know, what, what would we do if we, if we could, right, if there were no kind of constraints, and I absolutely think, yeah, you know, we should think about this. Think about uh, more creative ways of expressing our ourselves, stories, film. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, this is where you need to get involved as well with your ideas about, uh, you know, using novels, science fiction, etc. I think there's, I think students are starved for an IR that is more exciting and more interesting than the, than the kind of IR that you read in ordinary textbooks. Can I, can I, can I say that? I'll stop now, but I really look forward to hearing what others have to say, also in response to some of the questions that we have in the Q&A. Thank you, Dan. Um, I'm going to start to respond to what I heard, <laughs> but also some of the questions in the Q&A. Um, as we might remember, my chapter was very much about this teaching point, you know, how, how you can get this into the classroom and how important it is to have this discussion. Um, in the classroom and my own experience, um, which I wrote down with my students. And I really much agree that I had students who wanted to listen to this. And I was very, like Ashley just said, like, but, but not all of them do. And I think that's a very big difference between teaching intro to IR, that everybody, like hundreds of students have to sit there or having this carved nice small seminar that I was doing for about 20 students. And I was lucky to teach this in Berlin, also in Williamsburg and in the US, but always like people flock there who wanted to learn about this. So um, yeah, how, how do you do this? And and and, and Densa in the in the Q and A, she's one is she she he sorry, <laughs> is in the audience um, asking like what about this risk of not teaching the, the the canon that you have to 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 know. So what about you know only teaching those alternatives and the risk with this? I think there's so much out there still, the niche is so small still that this risk is not there, I think. So even if you have one class that is very sensitive about this, there are many others that students are exposed to that are about walls and Mersheim and went and you know, so on. So I think the danger is not of doing this too much, but just not doing it out of this fear. Um, I really hope this this structural burden that, that Gulsha was talking about, that universities don't want these classes or don't want to mix up their, their syllabi, you know, that, that there will be less over the years. Um, something else, I have a very empirical research project on global IR. We are collecting citation data and, and CVs and, and look at journals from um, all over the world on, on IR. And by the citations, we really, really see that everything goes through the core. So journals from China, Japan, South Africa, Mexico, Brazil, the, the theory canon is always, always the same. That's the core. And we don't see any citations across the global south. And um, our data set stops in 2015. I hope if we repeat this in, <laughs> I don't know, in 20 years, it might look different. But so far, the status quo is there. And I think it's very worth challenging this. And thinking about knowledge production. It doesn't always have to be alternative or critical, also something someone brought up. It doesn't always have to be critical theory. Just thinking about where knowledge comes from and that this is not the thing or the theory or the world, I think is already the first step to take. And 
wrap it in whatever you want. You can also talk about wind and walls and then, you know, think about where this came from. It doesn't have to be delete, like, you know, decentering all of this, but just making it aware that people are behind this, I think is the most important thing we have to take into the classroom and the discussions. Thank you very much. I'm looking forward to more questions coming from the audience. Um, thank you, Vipke. Um, I'll try and address one or two quick points. Um, first question was uh, from the audience was as to how the global IR language uh, in the IR, is it helping this kind of a project or not? I think it's a mixed bag uh, because it's um, somehow depends as to, uh, you know, how the term global IR itself has been used. Uh, you know, one of the formulations of the global IR has been professor uh, by Professor Amitabh Acharya. He's a very good friend, but still we take issues, you know, because by the end of it, I find that if you're looking for an inclusive IR, uh, where you're willing to listen to other voices, but without problematizing the problem as to why those voices were not heard in the first place, uh, why you're not getting into dissecting the politics of knowledge, uh, you know, that has kept those voices out uh, forever, for so long. Uh, you can't just add these in. You know, you have to really question uh, the very uh, sort of uh, these yardsticks, these golden yardsticks of what counts as knowledge, what counts as valid knowledge, what counts as IR itself. Uh, you know, so unless you problematize those very essential fundamental categories, I think you keep getting stuck in a loop. Uh, you know, uh, personally, I've had uh, issues, I've argued in some of my work that, you know, all these efforts of Chinese School of IR and Kyoto School of IR, and they're wonderful uh, to the extent that they're trying to diversify uh, the basis of knowledge. But my fear is that they will tend to get ghettoized, you know, that oh, Chinese School of IR is good to understand China. Uh, Kyoto School of IR is good to understand Japan, while we do the mainstream work. You know, what Vipke was saying in the beginning is freedom of choice. You know, so German students can do anything, but a student from China is expected somehow to do only assignments about China. Or, uh, you know, if it's about Indian IR, then, you know, you're good to only explain about India. So I find that really problematic. And uh, it, uh, half jokingly, half colloquially, I tell my friends that I'm, I'm probably very greedy. I'm not satisfied by only doing Indian IR. I want to just go and, you know, sort of, mudhead, you know, with a mainstream IR and just see what it is all about, you know, and why can't we just change the parameters of IR? I mean, after all, who decides what is IR uh, uh, to begin with? Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, uh, to come back to Gulshar's question, something I have honestly grappled with, I, I, I'm arguing with my colleagues that what happens if I don't have my university restricting me? How would I completely rechange my syllabi of introducing IR? And uh, so that's something that I've been honestly thinking about. Of course, I'm simply, you know, I get all these lovely patronizing smiles and say, Namita, yeah, 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 yeah. It's, it's good to kind of, you know, imagine and dream, but you know, you know, we're gonna get there. So I, I'm glad you asked that question. So at least I can tell you as to what would it, I would, you know, begin with the kind of a thing that, you know, sit in a classroom of students and understand their conception of what is international and then start, sort of really dissecting it from their vantage points. Uh, and uh, you can really take it apart and you can really put it together. And other thing is, in, even in terms of methods, I think social science is too restrictive. You know, what Arlene was saying about films, I do for my research students a course of alternative ways of doing IR. We do films, we do, uh, you know, sort of ancient texts. Uh, uh, I do popular culture, art now. Uh, I do graffiti. Uh, uh, you know, uh, and uh, we do IR like that. So there are actually very different ways of entering the subject of international. I think it's too restricted uh, to, um, I hate to use the word, uh, uh, but it, it's too constricted. Uh, it's too limited, uh, you know. So uh, I really hope that uh, textbooks that are coming up in future, hopefully uh, we would be involved in some of them too. Uh, we can actually uh, uh, take some of these questions up. One last question, uh, you know, uh, the uh, audience had asked was, what exactly are these stories you've talked about? Those several of you were so hard to find. Uh, I'll give you one example. Uh, I learned from a Polish colleague of mine while I was a Fulbright scholar. 
and uh, we were talking about state being a perennial phenomenon originating from europe and she mm -hmm. said you know but there was no poland uh, in between for some 100 years and i was very intrigued and i started looking at you know polish history and lo and behold she was right for 300 years there was no poland so she tells about the story of this grandmother you know this child uh, uh, grandma always used to say you know that with the grandfather always used to live somewhere close to germany but she never used the word polish the reason he never used the word polish was because there was no poland as a state in those years you know so she asked her grandmother you know that does it mean that uh, you know i don't have any ancestry of polish or am i not polish and her grandma gives her a very nice joke she says you know if the kitten go and give you know children in the china cabinet you don't call them kittens you still call them you know you, you know so you don't call them china cups you still call them kitten so you don't change who you are just because you've been given a certain conceptual constructs that we have created over this period of uh, years you know and uh, the other story that i came up with actually deliberately was of native americans uh, you know here is your anglo america center of ir and uh, this was a story about a young girl selvia who was celebrating the return of the blue lake now blue lake is basically the you know a place a, a place of sacred origin for this pueblo community which was taken away by president roosevelt and uh, amalgamated in a national forest after 60 years of struggle 64 years of struggle they won this land back uh, their free right to go back to the blue lake and it didn't matter to them that the sovereign right the sovereign nation is actually sitting inside a territorially sovereign territory of united states of america because for them the whole idea of sovereignty was cultural sovereignty and it didn't bother them the contradiction of being culturally sovereign within a territorially sovereign united states of america just did not matter to them so there are a lot of these life realities i find uh, which are really interesting to see as to how you relate to them uh, and that's what i find with my students too you have to be able to relate to their uh, ground experiences otherwise the subject is very alienating and very abstract and very boring if i may say so um, i'll stop here Hi, just to respond to Anahita's point about the tension between coloniality and agency. I think um, some of the chapters are trying to do that. At least I tried to do that in mine where I am talking about a colonial category um, or the way religion is constructed through you know, colonial understandings. But then I've also tried to include agency or how those perspectives are challenged and thought about differently. So I think the chapter is trying to do both things. I don't know if it does that successfully, but I've tried to sort of look at the tension and you know bring out the other aspect as well. And I think many of the chapters try to do that. So that's just to address your question about that tension. And uh, I, I see what you're saying. And I think that's a good point. Um, to address Gulsa's point about being able to do whatever you wanna do, I think definitely stories, because I think many cultures have for the longest time theorized through stories. I mean that's how that's that's what that the theorization has been primarily through storytelling and that and that continues in many cultures and so I think yeah that would be um, the way I would do it if I if I was told just do whatever you want <laughs> any way you want to do it and in terms of teaching I mean I'm also parallel I in, in parallel I teach an IR course completely based on film novels and um, a literature I mean basically the literature and popular culture and. Um, I have the freedom to do that, but but I guess the challenge is then you know you have to sort of telling students okay this is um, you know you have to unschool right so you're you're trying to teach them the mainstream because you need to equip them equip as in you don't want to put them in a disadvantage and then you're telling them you know to use Illich's expression you know just de-school and so it's that's the challenge you know when you're when you're trying to do IR I think anyway. I'll stop there. Oh, and um, just to address one of the questions, I want there, there's several questions in the chat, but just to address one about um, who are we talking to, who in the discipline are we addressing? I think going back to Navnita's point about pedagogy, I think that is um, where we that that's primarily you know the, it's in the classroom that the, those are the audiences I think that we're primarily talking to, 
and um, where this text, uh, you know, books like this would be useful. Um, you know, I'm, I'm less worried about the discipline. I think that's where, th I think it's the pedagogy that's the most important. Okay. Um... I was trying to look at the questions and trying to listen to others. It's multitasking, I'm challenged. Uh, I'll try my best again. Uh, one of the questions that I saw uh, was basically saying like, hey, mains are mainstream voices uh, hearing what you're saying uh, was one of the question asked, like you're speaking, but who cares? <laughs> um, or who is caring? That was a question asked. Um, and I was, as I was listening, I took a note, uh, something that Carolina, uh, Carolina said, quote, uh, dismantle hegemony, we're trying to dismantle hegemony in a very different sense. Uh, so it's not a question of uh, legitimacy, right? Uh, so like who counts you as legitimate, it's a question of justice, I see. So and the questions of justice, struggles for justice are not easily done. Um, um, which chapter to write, Gusha? I wish I wish I could write a chapter on power. <laughs> uh, I would have liked to write on question on power because as I was writing my chapter on foreign policy, uh, Arlene was angry at me and they're like, you're using, and this actually speaks to something that uh, Anaita asked, like critical theory, big CT and critical theory CT, like how does it speak to it? And I think uh, question of power is at the center of it because as I was writing my chapter, Arlen asked me like, aren't you being too Foucauldian and post-structuralist? And I was like, no, Arlen, I'm trying to do something else. So I think a uh, question of power, uh, how to understand power from all its various uh, guises, how it's experienced, how is it practiced, how is it resisted, I think is central. I can't, got Yusha, this is my utopian universe. I would have liked to write it. I'm not sure if I can write it, but I would have liked to write a chapter on power for sure. Um, because it's also, I think, Anaita's point about uh, engaging with the question of critical theories in its various guises is very much speaking about this. And here I say hola to my uh, de dear friends in the University of Hawaii, you know, who I'm speaking of. Um, and, uh, and another question that I quickly saw as being asked was the question that I, that the, the, the uh, I can't remember the name. Uh, but uh, someone has said, I, I don't like to be in the limelight. Thank you for not helping with this, Arlen. Uh, but somebody has asked like, so in response to a point brought up by Asla, this is a quote from Liberty Chi, uh, how to address active resistance to learn from the global South? That question, I don't have a response to you, Liberty, but uh, your question, thank you for your question. And that made me think uh, two things. First thing was, this project, I think, is already already a project that learns from resistance from the global south, right? In the sense that the struggles with colonialism, imperialism, uh, with all that experience, it has already learned. But uh, that's one aspect of uh, your question that made me think. The other thing that uh, your question made me think, I might not be responding to it directly, but it's inspiring. The other aspect that inspired me to think was, and I really like it, um, maybe this project is to, uh, could be as it advances in, uh, in addition to adding more chapters to it, but maybe it could be an exercise, at least for me, to, to think more about uh, not how to teach IR anew, right, or how to teach the students how to think about it differently, or to myself how to th think about this differently, but how to learn myself and how to help my students to learn, um, being open to, to new ways of thinking, it. you know, like not saying that like, oh, this is wrong, this, but, but to, to encourage them to learn more and different ways of learning more rather than only thinking about new ways of teaching better or teaching more differently or teaching more uh, you know inclusive ways just to learn so that's those are what I was inspired but but, but thank you for all the comments and hi <laughs> 
Uh, I, so what I would like to say or emphasize is that uh, social environmentalism as a concept and also as a practice is something that looks to the future already. So, and also that it's a, it's a result of a chat or a talk between South actors or agents like indigenous peoples, scientists, and Southern NGOs, but also Northern NGOs. So it's a rather chat among South and South and North and South. And what social, the social environmental, social environmental lens makes me look at the future, look at reality. Uh, one thing that we are I'm doing with another student, uh, this hair PhD project, is like world in peace building in Colombia, because for instance, the peace communities in, in Colombia, they are also social environmental. They don't, they, for them, peace is not only peace in society, but also peace with nature and all their livelihoods and all that. And what I would do for the future is like how we think more about the agency of the non-human, like the indigenous people say, because you have the agents of climate change. Now we are all locked in and that's the agents of virus. So I think one thing that the social environmental lens make us, makes me think and look at is all this non-human, all this force that's put us, us like now in lockdowns or whatever, that is only a virus, right? Only, but see it's killing so many people and, and we are all inside the house because of a virus or what is gonna happen because of climate change, for instance. So this is all the agents of the non-human. And I think this, uh, the indigenous peoples, they have a lot to tell about it. And I think the social env environmental lens is what makes me look at climate change or the virus or whatever and all that uh, Matthias was talking about uh, when we try to bring awareness about environmental issues to IR, but also to in the environmental community, we try to bring the Southern voices telling us, see the indigenous people, right? We're talking about the agents of the non-human, the agents of virus or the forest. The, vor the forest can speak and all that. So I think uh, for the future, I would be emphasize more this, the voice of the earth. And um, so, and also this, and I think it's already the future talking about social and environmental issues, the things that are all together, justice and peace and, and nature. That's it. <laughs> Thank you. So I, I would like to address uh, the question regarding teaching. I think that Ashley and Wilk have already addressed, but I, I would like to chip in on that. So how, what do we do when, when we face resistance or, or sometimes indifference, right? but at some level could be worse than, than resistance regarding uh, our topics or, or the things we are trying to teach, both from our students and sometimes our departments, right? So uh, what I would say is that, at least from, from my experience, the, the first thing I do is like to smuggle this kind of ag agendas in, in, in different, in different uh, courses. So I'm teaching later American studies and introduction to IR. So I bring the environment to, to those places, little concealed by trying to do the, the argument systematically. I think every one of us do, do that at some level, right? Because it has to do with our identity and the things we think that are relevant to, to, to understand what's going on around us. And the second, the second thing, I think it is important and again, this is more from my experience with, with environmental issues has to do, and I think that was something that Navnita said, and also Christina is try to relate to the daily experiences, right? Not to, 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 to think about this abstract uh, uh, concepts like our system governance or stuff like that, and try to bring that into the earth and day-to-day and, and, and -day experiences. So I don't know, that, that would be my take on this, but there's, of course, a lot, a lot, a lot of ground to, to cover. So thank you again for, for, for the opportunity. I, I'd like to address first the, the last question that is in the chat. Does giving voice to the world's silence, including the global South actors, necessarily mean holding critical views of world politics and IR? I, I think in our chapter, we, we definitely say that it, that's, that's not a reality, no. Uh, but what do we do? We call it the rogue other and how 
um, you know, a new way of engaging um, between different views of the world and how this new way of engaging creative in third space and that it can be more transformative can be beneficial not only for the, to the North or to the, uh, a fellow global Southern scholar or point of view, but also the rogue other. Uh, and I think that's, that's a way of exploring, um, you know, it continue this work as well, because we cannot take it for granted uh, that every single thing that is created in the South is critical theory. And, and in the way that somebody asked in the chats as well, uh, that everything that is created in the North is, is oppressing. Um, and that's why I think the, the future and the alternatives, and even to go to answer Anahita qu questions about Minolo and, and Minolo and the, you know, and the historical perspective, it's more, for me, it's more going beyond that. It's not having the fear to deconstruct without building something new or, and, uh, uh, and, I got, I got lost in my last point, but it's it's in the relation that I think that that aspect of relationality that we emphasize in our chapter coming from Taoism and Indianism and also from epistemology of the South from Professor Santos is that relationality makes us aware that there are multiple ways of thinking, but then we have to go beyond that. That's not enough. It's how we created the ethics to act um, with compassion and how we go beyond the discussions. I think Lily in the different work, she talked a lot about te lack and talent. So go beyond lacks and talents, becoming aware that any kind of lack can become at any point a talent. And starting from there to, to imagine something new. And another point is if there is something missing in history, um, that's something that I, I really learned from, from Lily as well. And why not having some good sense of humor and imagine that and not be afraid to create, even if it's in the imagination? Because as some, some of you said uh, today, theorizing come, came from storytelling and it's, a, it's actually a creation of a story. So we, I think we have to, I, I heard a lot of fear today and in a sense to dismantle fear we have to work on that third aspect that we emphasize a lot as well that solidarity um, being together to you know overcome fear in order just to be free to be where we are but not give you up giving up on how we relate to each other Unfortunately, we're out of time. So I would, I just want to thank everybody, Karen and Arlene for a, just a, a really fantastic book, Gulsha and Anita and Anahita for their wonderful comments and for all of the contributors to this, um, this book. Um, those of you who are present and those of you who are absent, um, it, as we've heard, it's a, a remarkable contribution. Um, I just want, want to pick up on my last final thought is um, picking up where Carolina uh, uh, left off. So there's a nice pa passage in the, the end of the conclusion of the introduction where uh, Karen and Ar Arlene asked, we are at a stage today where the Western story appears wanting. And I think that's, that's very, very true. And instead of justifying ourselves in response to a mainstream, we should justify this project in response to a mainstream that has fundamentally failed to describe the world, right? So we can actually claim, make that claim that a project like this actually explains the world better than those that we're writing against. Right, and that there's actually an empirical project about actually describing the world as it actually exists that comes from um, conversations among the South and South and between the North and the South and bringing an alternative view is not just a, an, an ethical or epistemic project, but it's also a, a project of being more accurate um, in the way we research and teach uh, the world. So um, just want to thank everybody in the audience and everybody for joining us. Um, and um, thank you. Thank you, um, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>